Yes, you predate us at CCO. How did you learn about, about it? Well, that's a great question, Thea. <clears throat> um, there was a showing one night of a film called Facing the Surge, which was about sunny days flooding in Newport News, Virginia, and the impacts it had on everything on people going to church, going to school, Navy bases for the United States there. And that film was sponsored by three groups, uh, the Natural Resources Council of Maine, and I had worked for them, and the Sierra Club, and I knew all about the Sierra Club, and then this other group I'd never heard of called Citizens Climate Lobby. And then after the film was over, there were presentations by each of those three groups, and <clears throat> I was looking for which group had the strongest program for federal governmental action because that's where I thought action has to take place in order to address climate change. And Sierra Club talked about their mission and hikes you can take with them and this and that, but they didn't talk about a federal program. And the Natural Resources Council of Maine talked about what we should do in Maine. And then this guy got up who was a Republican candidate for office and he said, I'm with the bipartisan Citizens Climate Lobby, and we are laser focused on getting Congress to do something about the climate. And I said, voila, that's my group. <laughs> and they trained me, and six weeks later, I joined them, six weeks later, I had a suit and tie on, and I was in Washington, D.C., and I was ready to lobby my members of Congress from here in the state of Maine because of Citizens Climate Lobby. So I've been, and I've loved it ever since. So who did, perfect. who did you meet in that first meeting down in D.C.? Do you remember which lobby meetings you had? Well, there were only four of us from Maine, and then recently we've had as many as, what, 15, 18? More than more. that. More. 30, yeah. Yeah. yeah, close to 30 people recently, just in four years, which shows the growth of Citizens Climate Lobby right there. Um, we met with Chelly Pingree in person and senior staff of uh, Senator Collins and... I think we met with Senator King himself as well, yeah. I remember when you first started getting, in, you went to a meeting yep. and came home and started talking about it and we decided to check it out. I mean, I thought the last thing I need in my life is another meeting, but <laughs> we went and, and they were, it's such a well-run organization. We got so much done in an hour and a half um, and that continues to happen first Saturday of every month and um, you come away with a sense of hope and, and a list of things to do, regardless of your strengths and weaknesses. And um, it really makes you feel like you're doing something meaningful. Do you remember our meetings in DC? Thea, you and I were on a team. Mama was off with another group, for most, except for one meeting. Yeah, we did um, King, it's, Collins. Yep. King and Collins. We also, they, because there were more Mainers than they knew, yeah. they, you weren't on that one, fall of 2019, but there was, that was the one that had about 30, I think. But there was a bunch of kids there that, that trip, and the last time they did them in person before COVID. Um, who else did we do when we went to other we states? Did, we did um, a Democrat representative, Meng. Right, from, um, from New, York. New York. And then this guy from... Um, I don't know. I want to say Kansas or Kentucky. Yes, it was Kansas. Kansas. Yeah. Mama had Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and what was your experience uh, being in on Capitol Hill in Washington D.C.? Well, I was pretty shy mm -hmm. because it was my first time being in Washington D.C. and I was meeting real congressmen and congresswomen, so I felt excited and overjoyed, but. But when we talked to them, they felt like real people. They listened to us, and it was just a normal conversation. Um, so I felt really good about it. Hmm. So. Did, I didn't expect it to be so fun, did you? Yeah, no. I thought this is you know, a good thing to do, and it's got to be done, and I'm doing my homework, and these are the things we want to talk to them about. And then, regardless of whether it was the senator, congressman, or staff person, it was just a uh, fascinating conversation every time. Mm. It's true. I really liked going to the trainings were so well done too. I felt like I was really knew what to say when I got there. There was something to fall back on when you felt nervous. Like, do you remember when the door opened and they said, okay, here comes Susan Collins. I was like, oh, wow, I'm really in a meeting with, uh, with a lawmaker I've read a lot about. And 
you know, disagreed with and agreed with it sometimes. But do you remember what it was like when Susan Collins walked into a room or when Angus King first, you know, your first time you met him or, or Pingree? Um, there were a bunch of kids around the table that day. Yeah. And Adolph was there from Sacred Heart Church, remember? Mm -hmm. yeah. You're sitting with a bunch of other kids, people from all walks of life, a climate scientist from Africa, and Senator Collins. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> when people ask me where I first had a, what's the burger, the Beyond Burger, mm. I, when I say, oh, have you tried those? They're pretty, they're pretty good. And it's like, ask me where the first time I ever tried one was. <laughs> where was it? Oh, it was in the cafeteria of the Senate office building. <laughs> 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 Sounds very important. I remember that. <laughs> I think it's important to say, though, that um, although Citizens Climate Lobby is indeed laser focused on Congress, and we do indeed go to Washington, D.C. in non-pandemic years, <laughs> <laughs> two or three times a year, um, that most of our work and most of the year is spent here in the home district. So we actually go to the district offices of our members of Congress. Uh, we also write letters to the editor because media has a big, and do social media because media has a big impact on what our uh, members of Congress think their constituents would like to see them do. Um, we also develop our own chapters of uh, Citizens Climate Lobby, and there are now, I think a dozen, maybe. Almost a yeah. dozen, say, roughly a dozen of them throughout the state of Maine. Um, and we also. Let's do grass cut. tops and grassroots. Right. So grassroots would be reaching out to people in general, either through broadcast, perhaps like this one, or at tabling events when in non-pandemic years. And um, grass tops is getting endorsements from uh, heads of organizations or members of organizations or municipalities that for our members of Congress represent a lot of constituents because they really want to know that when they vote in favor of something like a carbon pricing bill to stabilize the climate, that people in Maine understand why they're voting for that and, and are in favor of their voting for that. So there are a lot of different things we can do uh, depending on our skill sets. And in fact, uh, now we have a procedure where if you're interested in joining uh, Citizens Climate Lobby, your name is forwarded back to the local chapter and you get an interview usually asking you how much time you have, what your interests are, what your aptitudes are, and we try to match up aptitudes and interests with uh, time available to, uh, for the purpose of lobbying members of Congress. That's a great point. Yeah, it's, there's plenty of room for introverts to do stuff. Yeah. Like the letter writing and, and that kind of stuff is fantastic. Yeah, CCL has a lot of, um, you can choose what you want, and there's you. You don't have to get forced to do anything. You you do what you like and what you feel is important. Um, I remember there were rarely any kids my age, so I thought what to do. And then um, our chapter leader Sarah Brake came up to me and said, "Do you want to take pictures?" So I I got to take pictures, and I felt really good about it because. I'm doing something as well. Yeah. Good. What have you done for CCL like in the past week or month? What are you working on? Uh, now I'm involved in the Shelley Pingree meeting um, that's led by youth actually. I did a mini presentation of a, a site called En-ROADS and it, uh, I you told my teacher, and he said I could do a presentation to my class. So yeah. I'm really excited about that too. Yeah, I, and when I, I've, you'll maybe find the same thing I did. When I do these presentations, I end up getting a lot of great feedback. First, when you show people En-ROADS, first thing they say is like, oh dear, we're in deep trouble because it's so much work to get to where the scientists say we need to get to, right? To get from 3.6, which is business as usual, to 3.6, degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels is bad news. To get that to two degrees or lower takes a lot of work. But the nice thing, but then when you show them carbon pricing, I'm always amazed that people, oh wow, that does so much more than I thought it would. It's when you have to explain why and how to make it so that it doesn't hurt poor people and et cetera, et cetera. But all that stuff really does make people feel empowered that they can at least there's some there's some hope they can instead of being overwhelmed by the problem they can try to grab a hold of that and i remember 
I'm thinking about James Boyce, the economist, just recently made a presentation at the University of Maine in Orono, and he said, um, he gives presentations all the time, he always gets the same questions, like, why have I not heard of this before? And he says, well, it's because no one's gonna get super rich off of this, but it's gonna stabilize the climate and it's gonna put us in the right direction where, where we can t you know, mitigate the problem and try to go in the right course for the future. I mean, one of the most exciting parts is that not only is it, does it not hurt poor people, it's really good for poor right. and middle class people. Yes, we're talking about carbon fee and dividend, which is a, uh, a bill and it, that has been introduced in, the, in Congress twice um, with Republican support, and it would put a, a constantly rising price on carbon emissions, the things that are driving the greenhouse gases that are driving the increase in global temperatures and <clears throat> take all the money from the fossil fuel companies that, who paid for by this price and divide it into equal shares for all Americans. And uh, it's called carbon fee and dividend. And it turns out it, it, is, it meets the two tests that Citizens Climate Lobby has for any bill that we support, which is on the one hand, it'll be effective in driving down global temperatures and stabilizing the climate. And second, it will be helpful to poor and middle class people uh, in terms of paying for the cost of transition. Yeah, you, you know the story of uh, Marshall Saunders. Hmm. Could you tell, because um, I don't think Annie and Thea have heard that story about how it was founded, because it didn't start with carbon, Citizens Climate right. Lobby didn't come out of the gate with carbon no. fee and dividend. They settled on that after having those two prerequisites. It had to stabilize the climate and it had to um, help, or not hurt at least, and, and that's this case, significantly benefit the poorest. Um, but tell the story of Marshall Saunders, because you know sure. that story better. Sure. Uh, CCL was founded by Marshall Saunders, who was a real estate agent in San Diego, and he made enough money to essentially retire and go into philanthropy. His first philanthropy was um, making microloans to people, to poor people around the world. So if a woman in Bangladesh just needed, you know, $50 to get a sewing machine to start a seamstress business, he would try to, he would provide the microloans. And in fact, he was so successful using International Rotary Club as one of the extenders of that effort that it is said he made a million microloans in his career. But he noticed that the storm surges and sea level rise in Bangladesh was causing people to have to move inland. So sewing machine or no sewing machine, they were homeless. So he realized the major problem was climate change. <clears throat> and he decided he needed to focus on that. And he had a friend in San Diego who was a, um, this is an old reference, but a dare to be great uh, motivator for corporate uh, Fortune 500 companies. A guy named Mark Reynolds had his own consulting business trying to increase the efficiency of major corporations and their leadership teams. And he went to Mark and he said, listen, I'm trying to start this thing about climate change. Would you be willing to run the organization for five or six months? And Mark Reynolds said, uh, I think I could spare five or six months. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's 13 years later and Mark is still running Citizens Climate Lobby. <clears throat> and uh, and it's, it's been, in the early years in membership, it doubled in size almost every year, uh, you know, from 50,000 to 100,000 and 100,000 to now it's nearly 200,000 volunteers throughout the United States and dozens of other countries. But its, its primary focus is the United States of America. And we are still the second largest uh, polluter uh, of greenhouse gases driving uh, the, the, the disruption of climate. So, um, but, and the other model was, uh, there was a guy named Sam Daly Harris who ran a, a group called Results, which was about providing um, support for poor people around the world. And he ha he's written about direct democracy and how we as citizens can actually empower our government to do things. And in his case, he got the United States to, uh, I'm not sure the exact numbers, but more than quadruple our aid to uh, poor countries around the world, uh, one of the most effective lobbying groups in Congress. And so that model has proved to be the model for citizens' climate lobby. I remember hearing him speak a 
couple of years ago at the up in in New York at the regional. At Troy. Yeah, yeah that, he was he was wonderful, and it, it's it's true because I I think I mean, you've preceded me in this, and I've only done this. I'm going up. We're going up on three years this summer, I guess, but um, in that amount of time, it's. The, the story has evolved already. I remember how difficult it was to try to explain p to people carbon dividends, that this money that was going to be going into this carbon fee was going to be redistributed as an equal monthly dividend check. And that seemed like a preposterous idea, like there's no way we could trust the IRS to do that or the government to do that until COVID happened and all of a sudden people have real experiences with this. And now we're talking about doing this I I instead of having money that's being borrowed in order to send that out. We're now talking about money that is actually paid for with this carbon fee. So it not only mitigates the problem, but you're getting something good uh, uh, from, from the government and people, as they found in Canada, appreciating that, 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 uh, that policy quite a bit because that money helps them in other means of their life that has nothing to do with climate change. And it's fully fair because the polluters are the ones we're asking to pay. And they've known for decades that they, they were causing a problem and they've continued to cause the problem. Right. So uh, do you think it's funny that, well, because now we've got like cons traditionally conservative groups or business friendly groups, however you want to classify them, like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and, and, um, and other like the, the AP uh, with the American Petroleum Institute, for, for crying out loud, is, is now actually coming on board. Does that give you any pause that like is that that the folks who are responsible for so much pollution do you think that that uh, that wait a second there there must be something wrong with the policy if they're coming on board uh, no I think it's a recognition that uh, what all of us can see happening all around us which is the climate is being disrupted and uh, it its effects are negative they are not positive <clears throat> so the gut they're they're even Republicans or even extreme conservatives are convinced that the government is going to do something about the climate. And for the purposes of business, they want a predictable uh, plan. They don't want uh, something to suddenly be sprung on them or to be highly variable. And some approaches to climate uh, control or climate stabilization, like cap and trade, pr produce highly variable prices. And businesses mm. can't, can't plan based on that. Mm. So this is a program where the increase every year is known. It's, it's a base price of $10 more per year every single year, and, uh, and more if we're not reaching the targets of reducing uh, emissions that we want. And uh, business says, OK, that's a model we can work with. We know what the price is going to be of our supplies and our, and our products in the next year, in the next five years, in the next 20 years. Um, yeah, so they're in favor of that. I think yeah. they, see, you know, they see the tide moving. They see how, how general opinion is. Um, moving mm -hmm. and much in the same way that uh, some conservative lawmakers um, a few years ago wouldn't uh, it was dangerous for them to admit that this was a human caused problem and now they've already moved um, to say yes we acknowledge this that the problem is what we're going to do about it oh t tell the story about when you were Lobbying. Am I allowed from, to, oh. I don't think it's. I don't. As long as you don't specify who it was. Okay. I, I, you were at a coal yeah. country <laughs> meeting. Yeah, I was in a coal country meeting. Oh, so a meeting with a representative, yeah. U.S. House of Representative member from coal country. At his uh, aide, actually. Yeah. And we, um, you know, it was cool for me because it's. I still think of myself new on the lobbying end because that was my first and only live lobbying session, um, but you know, prepping for the meeting with these very experienced um, constituents or um, people who live near his uh, district saying, you know, just be careful what kind of language we use because he, they don't want to hear, um, they don't want to hear about solar panels, they don't want to hear, you know, anything that could be remotely negative about coal. And, um, and immediately, um, the young staffer said, okay, we now acknowledge that this is a big issue, and, uh, and so we've, we've made that step forward. Hmm. Hmm. It reminds me a little bit, I mean, on the opposite end of the extreme is like the environmental <coughs> justice folks that are concerned, you know, they have um, some concerns about carbon pricing because if you just think of it from a very the, 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 the veneer of it seems that, oh, if you're going to increase the price on carbon, that's going to hurt people who are living paycheck to paycheck. Um, 
and also it doesn't address some of the kind of the, the injust historical injustices that have happened to folks who are really taking climate change on the chin already. Um, and a lot of that has parallels with injustices as far as income and race and stuff. But where there is a lot of overlap on this, this does help because of, of the fact that it predominantly helps the, the poorest. And there's an overlap between that and the other injustices. Right. Yeah, and Citizens Climate, Citizens climate Lobby agrees that there'll have to be complementary policies. Right. This is not a one-shot deal. This is not a silver bullet. It, it'll, it'll require a silver buckshot, a range of programs. And so, for instance, having to do with coal country, there will be a shift away from coal, a very dramatic shift. But we supported last year the Reclaim Act, which will help support coal-based coal communities as their, their jobs are lost, as they have been lost over the last 20 years, but as they will increasingly be lost. And I guess I'll add one other thing, which is um, these, these companies, um, the, the, the oil companies and gas companies, are very well-managed companies. And they all know how to shift. It's not as though right. they're going to close up shop altogether. Yeah. First of all, they're 80% of the economy uh, energy source right now. And second of all, a company like Statoil, which was the Norwegian uh, offshore oil company, has, was, which was the largest builder of offshore oil platforms, is now called Equinoa, same company, same leadership, and it's now the largest producer of offshore wind turbines. So you can see there's, there's a lot of, uh, these companies will move, they're already moving, they're already pricing carbon internally, so this is just adding an external price to carbon. Uh, the world is getting ready for this, even as we speak, even yeah. if we don't understand all the mechanisms that are involved. Yeah. Just can we do it in time? Yeah, <laughs> how fast can we do this? That's what, and CCL's job, we say we know we're going to get there, we're just trying to get there faster. That's right. what we're about. Yeah. When you talk yeah. to friends at school, go ahead, sorry. I, uh, I was just saying uh, about the job thing. Um, when people are losing jobs, we have to tell them, we just have to tell them the EICDA, the Carbon Dividend Act, will not just hurt coal. It will also bring other um, jobs. There's nothing really to worry about. We can do this and we can be okay. Yeah, so, it's going to help people. I guess I would add, you, you made a video of your presentation, isn't that right? Yeah. Because that's, I've actually seen your presentation, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, someone said, you know, if Greta Thunberg had just sat outside her school in Sweden, uh, nobody would have known about it. But she publicized the fact that she sat outside the school. And you've publicized the fact that you've gone through this training and have this experience. So that's, that's a critical part of what we do. Mm -hmm. What do you think your classmates' reaction is going to be when they learn those figures? And um, well, they... We, we, they already know that climate change is an issue and because, and um, I think at King and other, uh, and other schools that they've been moving towards like green silverware and composting. Um, they know that's all important. I think when they hear about carbon pricing, they'll sort of think, what's that? That's where we all start is thinking, oh, this is a big problem. I'm going to do what I can in my house. So you like you get your compost <laughs> together or you try to recycle better or do a better job of you know, reusing and all that stuff. Um, efficient light bulbs. Efficient light bulbs. <laughs> try to save some money on that stuff or heat pump if you can <clears> do it and getting off of heating oil. But after that's done, it's like you can still do all those things, but it doesn't mean, you know, you can convince your neighbors or like set a shining example, but you can't have it be just voluntary and expect us to get there in time. Even the great stuff that Maine's doing, right? What it, the stat is 0.32% of the U.S. emissions come from Maine. So it's great that the governor and the climate council is doing all this wonderful work and I hope that the f causes the nation to follow suit. But to ensure that the nation follows suit and that we can meet those goals, we need that carbon price. It's like the biggest thing to do. And in elementary school, when I talked about uh, climate change, I, I didn't have the En-ROADS model. And I was just saying, climate change is important. We should do all this stuff. People will go home and tell their parents and say, let's um, get 
garbage to garden and let's mm -hmm. get recycling. They, it's, it's very critical that we tell them what is uh, the most important, what we need to do first. How yeah. effective. How yeah. effective. And you know, those, the, your classmates have cousins all around the world and some of them move to other states and it slowly the word spreads. They'll hmm. tell other people, and those people will tell other people. Right. In fact, one of the most important things I've learned from uh, Citizens Climate Lobby is that I can have a conversation with someone that I'm sure disagrees with me quite strenuously about climate and a lot of other things. <laughs> I've been in an office where every symbol in the room was <laughs> for <laughs> those people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we had a great conversation. Uh, and I remember the state, too, it was South Carolina. But, um, that, and, and it turns out that conversations about climate is one of the most important things to do, is to have conversations so that people become aware, aware that I care a lot about it, and it turns out they do too. We may have different approaches to what we want to see done about it, but the first thing we need to do is to start having conversations. Mm -hmm. And uh, Citizens Climate Lobby, deliberately, because we're bipartisan, we go to every member of commerce, uh, Congress. Um, we learn how to be respectful, how to show gratitude, how to have a civil conversation with people who differ from us or disagree. They have different underlying values, and as a result, they have different ideas about where we should go next. It doesn't matter. We can have useful, important conversations uh, and civil conversations, respectful conversations, and we do. We prove that over and over. Uh, yeah. yeah. And Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I just want to say that in the meeting that I'm going to do soon with Shelly Pingree, that's youth-led, um, there, there's different roles, and I'm the appreciator. So there, there's many, like there's the person asking her, um, will you endorse this bill, or, and, or will you support it? And But there's also the appreciator, and so we're not just only um, asking them, we're also thanking them. Right. right. And she's already a uh, co-sponsor, yes. so it's just seeing that she does it again in the, the next session, right? Mm -hmm. but, yeah. yeah, and we here in Maine are so privileged to have two senators, uh, Senator King, who's an independent, and Senator Collins, who's a Republican, both on the small uh, Senate Climate Solutions Caucus discussing what, what kind of legislation they can agree on to put forward. And there will be a package of climate legislation in the next month or two. And we're all hoping that it'll actually involve both Democrats and Republicans. Because as it goes through the Senate, it'll probably need at least 10 Republican votes to become law. <clears throat> and Yeah, and since I did the En-ROADS presentation for, that was probably part of this <laughs> document or the, the, the this show um, Senator Romney has come out in favor of it. Yep. Um, we know that Susan Collins has supported something very similar to this a dozen years ago. She just needs to be brought back to that. Um, Senator King has said some very great statements about climate um, and climate action, business friendly. Keep going, sir. Uh, he's inching closer and closer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people are inching closer. I think En-ROADS is helping a lot of people also compare which ones do what, you know. Who else is on? There's 14 people on that Senate Climate Solutions Caucus. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Six Democrats plus Senator King and seven Republicans. Yeah. Including Mitt Romney. Right. And, and Mike so, Braun is another one who's a supporter of it, or at least it's. <coughs> That's right. He's a Republican, Republican from Indiana. We're mm -hmm. always looking for the Republicans. They're the. Yeah. They're the ones that are trickier to find, <laughs> but yeah. it's great. And we know we know too, just uh, as a political matter that uh, Chris Coons, who's the uh, senator from Delaware and a very close friend of Joe Biden's, of course, yeah. being Delaware, fellow Delawareans. <laughs> yeah. uh, they must know each other. It's like a yeah. tiny state. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hey, Joe. <laughs> They're just on two different train cars, right? On yeah, the yeah, yeah. Uh, we know he's, he's actually the sort of um, the kingpin in the Senate for the development of new bills. And he has a bill of his own, but he's working with others to um, create bills around carbon pricing. We also know that three members of Biden's cabinet uh, or cabinet level positions, 
John Kerry in charge of uh, climate, uh, Janet Yellen in Treasury, and Pete Buttigieg in Transportation are all in favor of carbon fee and dividend. Right. So we now, we now have positions in Congress on both parties and in the White House that are in favor of this as one of the policies that will be in a climate package that will be coming up in the next month or two. So there's a real sense of urgency now that anyone who's interested in having an impact on what our national uh, climate policy might be, that they enter the fray now. And if, the, if you want a lot of education around how to do that, I can't, right. I can't suggest anything better than Citizens Climate Lobby. Right. Can you? And, no. <laughs> uh, and we've heard a lot about carbon pricing recently. Um, more and uh, more. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you want to high five sure. about that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's also a couple other things that's important is that the carbon pricing, unlike other, you know, other laudable ideas to try to get mitigate the pro the problem, it's expedient. It's quick. We can put that in place in nine months. Whereas other things, like how long have we been working for the the clean um, transportation the, yeah, the, sector? Yeah, it's just like it takes years for those kind of things to be implemented. And on top of that, with a Supreme Court that is. Uh, got a 6-3 conservative majority and maybe skeptical of overreach by the legislative branch, we know that pricing, you know, the, the, the purse strings are controlled by the legislature and that's very explicit in the Constitution. So it's kind of uh, resilient to any kind of um, attacks from the judiciary or from, the, from uh, lawsuits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess it's worth saying that we, we're talking very technically and very uh, yes. specifically about political this mm -hmm. and da 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 that and so forth and so on. And uh, believe me, if you'd approached me four years ago and asked me about this, I would have known nothing about it. Right. So that's, yeah. this is the result of a, of a uh, citizens' climate lobby legis um, education. Right. And in fact, the website, uh, which is either citizensclimatelobby.org or uh, Climate uh, Citizens USA, Climate USA. Oh, yeah, CCLUSA. CCLUSA.org, that's right. I always do the right. first one. It's um, is a veritable university of education about climate. So, uh, but a more uh, enjoyable way to find out about it is to uh, enter your name and uh, zip code in the, on the website and you will be directed to your local chapter and then you can actually get together with other folks <laughs> yep. virtually or in reality. Yeah. Uh, Hopefully yeah. by the time this airs, maybe in reality. Yeah. Maybe in reality, right? <laughs> uh, and, and find out uh, what the opportunities are for service and the opportunities are for education and the opportunities are for influencing your members of Congress. It's really, it's a, it's, it, it's a, it's a, I must say it's a special uh, experience in my life to be, in par to be part of this. Before I saw that film and went to Washington, I had never contacted my member of Congress about anything. Mm. I had not written a letter, phone call, visit, nothing. I lived in Washington, D.C. a couple times. Never did this. So um, mm. I would suggest that you, you probably think that the federal government is really distant from you. But in fact, it's kind of right next door, and uh, the fact that it's so close to you and you have such access to it will be made clear if you join and become active in Citizens Climate Lobby. Mm. Yeah, and you get, I didn't think, go ahead, Sia. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, the skills that you, like, if you're, uh, it can make you cultivate skills you never thought you were capable of, like being a communicator to a, to, in a lobbying meeting. Those people make six figures. And here I am trying to build those same skills. And on top of that, you know, so you, you make good friends, you learn a lot about climate, you feel like you're making a, as big of a difference as you can by actually moving the people who can control the most into creating a sol solution in the right direction. And, um, and did you sleep better at the end of, of the day because you've, you've done that, so. Mm -hmm. Did, you, did you mention you have fun? And you have a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, um, not only is, uh, is uh, acting on climate um, and CCL for congressmen and going to lobby, but also just to just to um, get back to like we were just talking about the other day. Um, what what will happen if this doesn't happen and we won't ever build a snow fort again or. Mm. 
Yeah. Go skiing. Yeah. It's, it's not just about lobbying. It's about so many other things. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And everybody has their own special reason for how, what makes them the saddest or what motivates them. And we tell the story all the time. But in my family, we used to um, get together on New Year's and buy wholesale shrimp off the boat, main shrimp and spend a lot of time shocking 10 pounds of shrimp and then stick them in the freezer. We had shrimp for weeks, months, a year, whatever. And then, and now we can't do that anymore. There are no more main shrimp to be fit. You know, it's, um, yeah. you can get them from Nova Scotia. Hmm. You can get them from Newfoundland. Go yeah. further, further north. Yeah, yeah. 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 And that's where our lobsters will end up coming from. Yeah. If we right. Uh, stabilize things pretty quickly. Right. Yeah. But you have to make sure that you do a balance, right? I get scolded for spending too much time trying to save winter than, and to make sure I turn around and savor it and go for a good Nordic ski or do something, you know, make a snowman or, you know. Um, it's a nice place to live in Maine and I just wait, I don't want to imagine all the things that are gonna go away from Maine, you know, winter, outdoor recreations, um, healthy lifestyle in the summer instead of don't have to worry about as many ticks and other diseases, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. blueberry crops, whatever, be lobsters, all that stuff is just like quintessentially Maine. How weird will it be if mm -hmm. that all goes away? Mm -hmm.